Greetings, I'm John Duvall, and this is the Truth Factor Discussion. We'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy week to join us during this time period as we factor the truth of God's Word into our daily lives. Gentlemen, it is good to see each and every one of you here today. We are missing Daniel, so Paul, let's start with you and see how you are doing. Doing great today. I'm ready to study, and we're in 1 John chapter 4. Uh, if you're in the chat, we'd appreciate you going ahead and signing in. It's the only way it'll let you make any comments. If you just click on the word guest at the bottom of that window, uh, if you're not already signed in, it'll assign you a guest name, and you could use that. But even more fun would be to uh, highlight that and type in your own name uh, so that we, uh, we can interact with you through the chat. How are you today, Tom? Um, I'm, I'm doing fine. Uh, as always, it's beautiful here in Southern California. Looking forward to the study as well. Uh, we do have a gospel meeting that we are preparing for in a couple of weeks with Randall Duvall, who's uh, most of the time in our chat room, and so and I'm going to do my best to get him and his brother Alan to uh, uh, join us. you got to be careful. He names names, so watch out. So, Roy? Well, well, that's good. <laughs> Royce, how are you doing? Doing great, and uh, good to be with everybody. My uh, voice quality may be a little bit different. I'm not sure exactly why it's not uh, allowing me to use my default microphone, so I'm using a less uh, capable microphone, the, the one in connection with the, mic with, the uh, with the camera. So hopefully I don't sound too terribly bad, but uh, it's good to be here and great to see you guys. Uh, I think, that, however, the place is is inhabited by a predominance of bald guys, certainly greater than in the percentages in society. Right, Paul? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you actually sound you sound very clear, Roy, so that's... Oh, good. Okay, yeah, good. It sounds good, yeah. All righty. Well, last week we left off in our study. Um, oh, by the way, let me plug our gospel meeting. We have a three-day gospel meeting coming up that will be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, this upcoming Friday with uh, Aaron Andrews. Uh, he preaches for the... Um, oh, I've drawn a blank. The Church of Christ in Alabama. Uh, <laughs> it's near Rogersville. It, that one. <laughs> oh, 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 there's one there, huh? Yeah, th there's one in Alabama. Yeah. Oh, it'll come to me later, probably once we're done. That's not good. Anyway, he's going to be holding our meeting for us. And so if, if you'd like to... to Join us if you would view us live uh, via the uh, internet. You can do that at SeminalPoint.org. We'll have singing at 7 o'clock Friday and Saturday, followed by the, the, the preaching at 7.30. And then Sunday is our regular time. Uh, Sunday evening we'll meet at 5 for singing and 5.30 for services. So that's this upcoming uh, weekend. He, he lives in Rogersville, Alabama, but that's not where he preaches at. It's a nearby Anderson. That's it. Thank you, chat room. Thank you very much, uh, Ken, specifically. Yeah, Anderson, Alabama. He preaches for the Anderson Church of Christ. So we've got that coming up. All righty. So, and, and as we mentioned earlier in the pre-discussion, we're going to be taking next week off. Um, I'm going to be on a short little trip with my family. And so uh, we're just going to, uh, you know, if I'm not here, the whole show falls apart. And so we're just not going to do it. Uh, no. <laughs> No, really, I think the guys would be fine by themselves, but I do some updating of the website so you can view it live, and I'm not so sure I'm going to be in at a particular spot where I could get that done in time. And so we'll just, just give everybody a week off. So, All right, so let's start with First John chapter 4, uh, there in verse 17. I, and, believe uh, it's, I believe it's part of the government shutdown. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm sorry, you're being furloughed. So. Let's hope so. Yeah. I, you, I, know. <laughs> I, I, you notice they said it was non-essential government workers? Yeah. But I, I tell you what, though. Non-essential, get rid of them. Anyway. The, the, one, the one good thing about when the government does this, fur coats get longer. <laughs> Furlough. Yeah. Okay. Roy, since you laughed at that, uh, <laughs> read for us verses 17, 17 through 21, and now we'll get serious. My first thought when I looked at that by this, love is perfected with us in laughing at your dumb joke. However, <laughs> there's a much greater 
uh, love, and I love this passage. There are just sub, several passages in John about this. You know, uh, what what a great love God has shown toward us, and that we can be called the children of God. But now here, by this, love is perfected with us. I'm reading the New American Standard Version. Um, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is so also are we in this world there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love and going down to verse 21 we love because he first loved us if someone says I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Okay, thank you, Royce. Step it back up there to verse 17. Um, and as you pointed out, this is, this is such a very important part of this text. It's not anything new, but he's, he's bringing the, the thoughts here to a very fine point. What when well, he says or go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I was gonna make the observation. Anytime the Bible talks about love, uh, it's almost always treated as a priority. And I know we've mentioned that before, but uh, we're about to get into some verses where it's very strong. It's worthy of mentioning that. You know, first Corinthians yeah. thirteen verses one through three. And you just all the verses that, that, that talk about love and describe it. Uh, just keep that in mind. Right. And, and within this context, the love he's talking about is the love for one another with the godly love seen there in verse 16. Okay, But verse 17 is talking about something a little bit different, but it helps to establish the point as to why we should continue to love one another. He says that love has been perfected among us in this, and, and here it is, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So are we talking about the love of God being perfected in us in that he sent his son to die upon the cross of Calvary so that we may have boldness or confidence in the day of judgment? Well, that's the that, that I would say that would be a result of me knowing that I uh, am a recipient of the love of God. Uh, that would give me boldness in the day of judgment because okay. as he is, so also are we. Well, we've talked about before how this word um, perfected can, can mean completed or brought to a, con, uh, a completion. And yeah. if you look at that, certainly the time at which we can be and, and have confidence when we uh, see the Lord uh, in judgment, that's ultimately when that is completed, when, he has, when it has resulted in our salvation. Uh, the Lord's love has been shown to us. We have received that by obeying the truth, and it is ultimately completed uh, in judgment. Okay, all right. There may be, there may be a, kind, of an, a, kind of a side point here. Uh, the scripture speaks of, uh, you know, the, that grand old passage, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, there may be a sense in which the love of God is frustrated in the fact that while he loved the whole world, in fact, there are few that will enter into uh, into heaven. But the love of God is not frustrated in the sense that uh, all of those who will come to believe are those who are predestined unto eternal life. Uh, God's, God's plan was always that there would be a provisional entrance into fellowship with him, and that would be on the basis of faith and faithfulness connected there too. So uh, I've, I've, heard, I've had discussions with people who, who say, well, if your way is the only way, uh, then that, that means virtually everybody in the world is going to be lost because not everybody's going to agree with you. Well, that's exactly what Jesus said. Broad yeah. is the way that leads to destruction. And well, many he, people that he, go does, in he does make the point in this verse, uh, similar to what Royce is mentioning there, because as he is, so are we in this world. That we are, uh, the in John 17, when Jesus is praying there, he talks about how 
the world doesn't uh, basically get us, if you, if I can paraphrase there, because it never really got him. It never understood what he was about either. That's true. Tom, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, one thing that comes to my mind is, is I'm curious in that verse number 17, and as it reads in the New King James, and I noticed the New American similar, uh, it says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness. My question is, is the this a reference to what he says afterwards or what he has already said? And, uh, and uh, both are true, by the way. <laughs> you know. Well, the, the way that I look at it, and um, let me, I'm going to check one other translation here real quick just to kind of see how it's rendered there. Uh, since we don't have Daniel with us today, I'll have to read from the English Standard Version. Yeah, he um, says with us. Yeah, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day yeah. of judgment. Right. You know, I, I look at it the way that you're the way that you're talking about, Tom, in that um, the love has been perfected among us in this. Okay, here is the result of the love that's been perfected among us. Or the yeah. result of it is that we can have boldness in the day of judgment. Right. It yeah, makes us yeah, right before God. Yeah, exactly. And, and and I mean, kind of looking at it, what I, what I see is what we discussed last week in verses uh, 15 and 16. And you know, there it talks about verse 16 that God is love and he who abides in love abides in God. Mm -hmm. God abides in him. I, I kind of see it, and I very well could be wrong because I am no Greek scholar. I kind of think that that verse 17 is a continuation of that where he is saying love has been perfected among us in that fact. And as a result of that fact, we have boldness in the day of judgment because he is greater than the world, and he'll emphasize being greater than the world following that in the, the next few verses. Yeah, what, what's interesting here within the text, you know, John, John, we, we see that there is a thread of loving our brethren that he talks about, right. but then he comes in and shows us the big picture of how we're supposed to be. And if we're this way, then this little thread is, is going to be as it's supposed to be. Um, the, the idea of have boldness in the day of judgment reminds me of Hebrews chapter 4. And let me bring that up on the screen there, verse 16, where the writer of Hebrews says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I mean, it, it's, it's not just that we have confidence of spending eternity with God in heaven, but this confidence in God enables us to go to God in prayer and to petition Him and to rely upon Him. And one other thought, when it says, because as he is, so are we in this world, if we allow, if we take the opportunity afforded to us by the love of Christ, it should transform our lives. We should change. Romans 12, 1 and 2, not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Complete right. change. So as he was, so are we in this world. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, uh, oh, and, and I was going to say, and what gives us our boldness in the long run where this world is concerned is the love of God, understanding the degree to which God loves the world, and that's the degree to which we need to strive to love the world. Uh, I mean, uh, they're related to one another, which, which I think is kind of the point that he is making here. Uh, when he gets down to the way that we love our brethren, who obviously are in the world, even though we're not necessarily of the world, uh, you know, you're still dealing with flesh and such, uh, the the bottom line is is we have to figure out or learn what the love of God actually is, and that's what we strive to emulate. And if we emulate that, every we're going to treat the world properly, and we're going to treat our brethren properly, so on and so. Forth. It seems to me that there's a uh, there's a connective that grows out of the latter part of verse eight. Matter of fact, the phrase in verse eight that God is love. Because having said, and I'm going to pick up verse 8, then I want to go into three passages in quick succession. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son. Now skip on down to verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him. Then come on down to verse 17. By this love is perfected with us. I think though th that's, that, that repetition of by this, every one of which ultimately flows back to the simplicity of that statement in the latter part of verse 8, that God is love. Yeah, exactly. 
uh, feeds every aspect of this relationship. This is how we know the love of God is manifested in us. God gave His only begotten Son into the world. That's not love. You know what? What would be? Uh, by this we know that we abide in Him. If we if we're loving one another, God's loved us. Now if we're loving one another, by this we know we abide in Him because love is of God. Back now to verse 17. By this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence. You have a whole series of uh, of identifying results, effects of the presence of divine love in the world. Yeah, I think that's a very a very good. Point and, and thought to show the connectivity there through that. Isn't that as we press toward verse 18, isn't that uh, the same kind of thought that's being brought forth that when we realize the love that God has for us, the uh, provision that He's made for us, the salvation that He's provided for us, that He loved us uh, before we ever loved Him, uh, all those things, and He makes these statements about uh, no fear in love and how. Uh, as long as we we have this uh, fear, the love of God's not perfected in us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm gonna bring in a comment of Randall's in the chat room before we go father, so it doesn't get kind of uh, kind of swept behind there. I mean, talking about how that we are, uh, as he is, we are in the world. Randall reminds us of John 17, 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then in verse 23 of John 17, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfected into one, that the world may know that thou didst send me and lovest them, even as thou lovest me. So it's very good, two great passages to, to connect with, that statement there. I would yeah. never argue that, that that you just have a random use of any particular word in the uh, in the scripture. The Holy Spirit knew exactly what he was doing in the words that he chose. But it is kind of interesting that Randy's citing there of John seventeen twenty three uh, that uh, when he is in his disciples and and the Father in him that they may be perfected into one. And now here we have this same repetitious concept that love is per perfected with us, yeah. So that we may have confidence. Uh, yeah. What what could the disciples have possibly accomplished had there not been this consciousness of the fact that the Lord had commissioned them to this task, sent them to do the job, and know that their work would be effective in the world? That's true. That's true. Um, any any other thoughts? All right, let's let's move to probably what is the second most misused passage in the Bible, <laughs> as far as the frequency with which with which it is quoted out of context. Um, verse verse eighteen: There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So here's the application. If you fall in love with somebody, don't ever let anybody tell you you're not supposed to love them because true love casts out fear. Isn't that what John's talking about? <laughs> no. I've actually never heard it described that way, John. Me but, neither. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but but if, if, that is, uh, if that is the application that some would apply toward that, certainly uh, we could uh, well, the take Romeo great problem with that. Well, of course. You know, don't be afraid to love the one that you love. You know, love has no fear. Well, in my in my day, one of the hot songs, if you can't be with the one you love, you may as well be with the one you love, the one you're with. Yep. Boy, what perverse right. concepts we have about what love is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and of course, the challenge is with the many different ways the word love is used yep. in the English language. And that's just thrown around, and and, and even even the usage in the Bible. Well, you know, we know the Greeks had four different words, at least, that are translated yeah. love in English, uh, from that standpoint. Now, now, when when I see in this expression, if, if I can say something, uh, is uh, I see the idea of the no fear in love being tied back to the boldness of verse number seventeen, and it's, and yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, love, the love that we have for God and God's love right. for us. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And if we love God the way that we ought to, and number one, to do that, we have to understand what the love of God is. 
and uh, we, we need to understand how to love God. But if we have the love of God, it's going to cause us to overcome our fears in doing what we need to do. And, and the reason is, is because we're not afraid of being punished by God. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is we love God. We know that we're doing that which is pleasing in His sight. So we have no reason to be afraid of Him for rejecting Him. Right, right. Um, but I, I want to make a connection here before we, we miss something, and I, I nearly missed this one as we went through this. All right, verse four, verse seventeen. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Verse eighteen. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Okay. Right. If we keep this within the context regarding regarding this type of love that we have been perfected in. If we have been perfected in the love of God, in other words, we have been saved, we've been washed, our sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb, and we have this confidence towards God, then we should fear nothing. No matter what anyone right. would say or do to compromise our Christianity, we should not fear them. If we do fear them, and we begin to deny our Christianity because of our fear for them, then His love has not been perfected or completed within us. John, yep. do you think that there's some connection there? Uh, and I, I don't disagree with the fact that we we have to be bold and courageous in, in standing for the truth in the face of those who would oppose us. But do you think there's any connection between that the, there in verse 17? He says that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. And then he says that uh, we cast out fear because fear involves torment, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Punishment. fear has not been made perfect in love. you think he's talking about what man can do to us or about what God can do to us? I think what man can do to us. If we fear what man can do to us, then the love of God has not been perfected in us. I was, I was tying that back with, uh, with judgment with the yeah, uh, and, I, I, and the fact yeah. that we can approach judgment, not that we don't respect mm, God, but okay. that we can approach God with, with, uh, right. with confidence uh, and knowing that, that He has provided the sacrifice for our sins and that if we are faithful to Him, that He will save us. And that takes away the, the fear of the torment that it speaks. And I'm not saying uh, right. I have to have my way on that. Uh, I was just expressing uh, how I yeah. was look, looking at that as I read it. Well, well, you know, and it, uh, it kind of seems to me like what you're talking about there, Paul, at least in, in my mind, when I see the torment there, uh, I, I see the idea of uh, standing before God and giving account for that, especially when you think about how the perfected love uh, doesn't, or it, it casts out our fear. And, and when he points out the one who, who fears has not been made perfect in love, uh, uh, I want to make an observation about that last statement there, um, the idea of not being made perfect in love. Uh, I view this the same way that I view faith the same way that I view a lot of qualities that we're to develop as Christians. And that is the reason we stumble in this life the way that we do is because we're still learning. Very few of us, if any of us, have perfected the love of God in our lives. Very few of us, if any of us, have perfected our faith. And, and you can go on down with, uh, you can go there to Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Every one of those qualities, very few of us have perfected those to the point where we never stumble in those things. And, and I think therein lies the challenge. And, and I believe that that's why we have a degree of fear. And, uh, and as long as we have not perfected our love for God, a little bit of fear is a healthy thing. Because uh, uh, contrary to what most of the religious world teaches, once saved, always saved, is a false doctrine. Royce, do you have any comments? Well, I'm just uh, I, I, my my approach to this is totally different. I I, I kind of see I, I understand the point that uh, that Paul and and uh, Tom are um, agreeing on. And I, but I tend a little bit toward yours, but my perception on punishment here is totally different here. Um, <coughs> is someone slamming the door on me there? Um, uh, Jonathan was leaving, my son. Oh, okay. He's, he's going to take his test Tell him in thanks. college. 
And thanks for slamming the door. Yeah, uh, I, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if the punishment here is not the view that the Christian takes of the danger of standing for the Lord, taking his stand for the Lord, and being fearful of that sees himself perhaps the recipient of the judgment of men, punishment at the hands of men, uh, torment at the hands of men. Actually, I like punishment rather than torment because I think that better describes the word itself, even though torment is uh, correct. It's not a wrong translation of that, I think, within the context right. of it. Um, so do you think that uh, boldness in the day of judgment in verse 17 is referring to an earthly day of judgment? I believe it's talking about the same day of judgment that uh, the Apostle talks about in Hebrews 10. Uh, but I think in verse 18, when he, when he, when he cre where he creates what I think is a contrast between being, having the love of God perfected in us and having boldness in the day of judgment, it ought to also produce a boldness in everything that we do in life, yeah. just to stand before our fellow man a boldness to confess Christ, a boldness to endure whatever's there, and not not to let a, some kind of an unrealized fear about being punished uh, uh, be, because we're doing this. If we don't recant our faith, well, oh no, I, I, I'm fearful that, that they may do something to me, that tor they may bring torment to me. I, I think that's the whole point of verse 18, but now that's... You know, that's just me. It's a little bit different twist than than uh, all of you have put on it, but that doesn't make it right by any means, I suppose. Right. Yeah. In our oh. chat, in our chat uh, Daniel has a comment there. It's the very last one. We got into a little yeah. uh, fun conversation before that, but uh, not that scriptures aren't fun. But uh, it says there that uh, Daniel says, A child who has not done anything wrong does not fear their father coming home. But speaking from experience, when I did wrong, I was afraid, and I'm sure that's true. But, you know, God wants us, and this is the point that I've always thought about when I read about here, love being perfected, uh, boldness in the day of judgment, uh, no fear in love. I've always perceived it that most of us, when we've obeyed the gospel, uh, at least at first, it was that we didn't want to go uh, to an eternal hell exactly. and lose our soul. But over time, uh, I think we develop. Uh, an, more of an appreciation for uh, how much God cares for us. We understand that at the very beginning, but we develop that more and more, and we serve God less and less out of fear and more and more out of a, a love for Him. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll not belabor that point anymore. And I'd be happy to hear other other thoughts about that. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh if I can say something real quick here, you know, on that, uh, one of the things that I've emphasized uh, based on what Paul just said there about when you first obey the gospel, uh, you don't you don't want to go to hell, and the the fear causes you to respond. But in time, that fear needs to be over replaced by love, and I think that they correlate to one with one another. And what I mean by that is, the more you love, the less you fear. The more you fear, the less you love. Uh, uh, when I when I see that, one of the things that I say to people is, if the only reason you are serving God is because you're afraid of Him, be prepared to live a miserable life. That's not the motivation behind which you want to uh, have that relationship. Just like you don't want to have that relationship with your wife or or your spouse or whatever. I mean, where you're afraid of them. If if the only re if if your relationship is based on fear, it's going to be a miserable relationship. If it's based on love, and the greater that love is, the less reason there is to fear. And even when conflict comes up, you know that you're going to be you know that you're going to be able to deal with it because the love is so much stronger than the fear. And 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 one other real quick point, I, I looked up that word uh, the word torment. Uh, the root words actually only used twice in the New Testament. Right. It's found here, and it's also found in Matthew 25 and right. verse number 46. These will go away into everlasting punishment, right. uh, but the righteous into eternal life. So j just just for what it's worth, I don't know if that adds light to the Scripture or not, but anyways. Well, I don't know what I believe. Um <laughs> You know, John, I don't disagree with the point that you made uh, earlier. Oh yeah, oh not at all. Uh, I think I think I would just in well, my in my understanding, I would just turn to a different passage. 
Well, let me let, yeah. let me kind of share with you for a minute, and I don't want to belabor this much. Um, kind of kind of the thought process, which kind of, right now is working kind of like a ping pong. Um, okay, he says that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. All right, so that's a very a valid point to make there. That if he's talking about boldness in the day of judgment, then the fear in verse eighteen would be the fear of the day of judgment. Uh, because you fear the punishment that would come to those who are not faithful, but if you properly love the Lord and are faithful, then you should have you should not fear the day of judgment, uh, because um, you are you are prepared for that. But then you right. think about it from on the other side of the coin. John wrote this probably around the time period that Nero began persecuting the church, somewhere in that right. ballpark. And he talks a good Nero bit. Nero or Domitian or Domitian. I'm sorry, not Nero. Domitian is who I'm thinking about. Domitian's one yeah, persecuted sorry. the church wholeheartedly. Um, and then you think about the number of times he talks about confessing the name of Christ, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then we see in what is the Second John where he says, "Receive not him that does not bring the doctrine of Christ." So under that, under that the, the time frame, it very well could be that. The, 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 the boldness very well could be any judgments that would come upon them because of their Christianity, and they would not fear what men would do to them because the love of God has been perfected in them. So, you know, it, it yeah. could go either way within the context. I don't disagree with what you're saying, John. I, I, for me to understand it yeah. that way, I would have to say that the day of judgment that's mentioned there is talking about something other than eternal judgment, and and yeah, that, exactly. I would have to draw that conclusion too. If you know, un, un, under that idea, he could be preparing them for the judgments that they would face at the hands of domination, and so forth, right. which isn't surprising, you know. Right, and, um, and of course the challenge is, as we know that the Bible uses the term "day of judgment" to refer to many different things. And yep. context has to dictate. And, and, yep. and the bottom line is, is we are all in agreement that both statements are true. Exactly. I, yeah. I, I, I think all four of us could say that, or I should say both directions or understandings are valid. It's just the question of this text. Yeah, I, I have a hard time taking the word judgment outside of the, 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 the judgment day context. It, yeah, um, exactly. And, and, and I so. do too. Yeah, I think I'm going to walk the line on this one. Verse 17 is the day of judgment. Verse 18 is we don't need to fear men. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but but yeah, yeah. I think everything has been said. The application of it all falls right within the proper lines of the Scriptures. Uh, it, Daniel, has anyone else chimed in from the chat room? Uh, yeah, we yeah, have a couple of comments is. there. Uh, as we look at that, John, uh, <laughs> I think Paul had that mature faith. Yes, I think Paul had that mature faith where he can make the statement, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You know, he goes on there to say, uh, henceforth there's laid up for me the crown of life. And so he could express, you know, not, not approaching judgment with fear, but that here I have served the Lord faithfully, and by his grace and his love, his mercy, I can uh, have confidence. Uh, they... Uh, I guess uh, when he says we agree, that's Daniel, Randall, Dina, uh, whoever's there. They agree that this is final judgment. And did I, uh, Paul the Apostle? Yeah. yeah. What, what did I say, Tom? No, you. No, oh. I'm just telling you. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can have confidence when we stand before the great King if we have been perfected in love. And Randall says, uh, or someone there in his household says. Of course, this is a lifelong journey, and that's right. Uh, and that's what I was talking about before with the idea of contrasting love and fear and uh, why we serve God. Okay. And then he says, Second Corinthians 3, 4, and such confidence have we through Christ towards oh. to Godward. Yep. It, you know, that just popped up there. As we look at this, uh, guys, you know, this is a good example of the fact that you know, we didn't get together beforehand and say, well, what are we going to teach on this? Uh, try to set policy for everyone else. But we have a, a couple of different views here and, and a good discussion on this. And uh, certainly uh, right. we don't find anyone teaching anything that's far afield from what other passages of Scripture teach. Yeah. But, we, uh, but we can have an honest and open discussion as we try to factor these things into how we live every day. Uh, if you're looking at the, the point that I was making, 
uh, you'd understand that we need to understand God's love for us and live faithfully mm -hmm. before Him and have confidence in our salvation. But if you would look at, at the other viewpoint that's made here, we need to not fear what man can do to us, but we need to uh, live a life that loves God and is going to serve Him no matter what uh, the earthly consequences are. And so they're both good, valid uh, Bible points. It's just a, a different way of looking at this particular passage. Yeah. Um, let me make one other final little comment right here, and then you can move on to wherever you want to go with it. I think it's just really, really important to see in this context, that last observation there, that the one who fears uh, is not made perfect in love. Uh, that's, a pre that's a present day fear. That's uh, otherwise, what would be the point of it of him being perfect in love? What uh, if, if it's the judgment day? Uh, the Lord's going to bring me through it, and I'm not going to care what anybody thinks about it. Uh, but the individual fears on a daily basis, or he rises above that fear. He triumphs over that fear. He confronts whatever challenges he must face in his life, and he does that because confidence in the day of judgment rests upon his heart, upon his soul. Uh, he, he knows that, that he has nothing to fear of judgment if he's standing uh, if he's standing where he's supposed to be standing and being perfected. Mm -hmm. uh, love. I, I just I think that passage is, is very instructive as to the nature of this punishment here. I, I, think, the, uh, I think the preferable term here is punishment as opposed yeah. to torment, just simply because that's what it's... Uh, uh, that's what it's used to describe. So, to me, I think of Stephen. You know, instead of running well, away, he stands there. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge. Absolutely. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Yeah. Well, and you could see Stephen applying both of those principles. Uh, Stephen recognizing the love of God in his life that he didn't have to fear uh, eternal judgment. He was ready. Yep. Yeah. Um, now, look at verse 19. Then John makes the point, we love him because he first loved us. And just pulling pulling this back together, um, the love that's been his spoken of is the love of God. And now we have verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. And that love was manifested when he sent his son to die upon the cross of Calvary. But now we get to the application, you know, kind of like what I mentioned a while ago. John makes us this huge argument as to why we should live faithfully in the full description of that. But now we're back to this this little thread. It's kind of like pulling a thread out of your shirt. All right, it may not hurt the shirt, but that thread's gone regardless. And and then this discussion of loving our brethren, he now makes a solid application as to why an individual is wrong if he hates his brother. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, one point before, and I was just noticing that when Royce read this, uh, and also I think the ESV points out concerning this, it doesn't use the word him. It says we love because he first loved us. And then I have a footnote in the New King James, which I use, which says, uh, uh, which says that the him is not in some of the later translations. Uh, and, and and that does change that expression a little bit. I mean, even even though obviously the love that we need to have is directed toward yeah. God, it, or it includes, it, it definitely includes God from that standpoint. Because, and that's what we've been talking about too, is God's love for us. Actually, it fits the context better to pull the word him out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah we love right. because he first loved us. Yeah, that's the context of it. We love others because he first loved us. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. yeah, and no, I think that's a good point. The New American Standard just has we love because he first loved us. Yeah. And incidentally, uh, notice the difference between Randy's beloved King James. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, King, uh, let us love. Now, it's not the let us love. It's the imperative we love. Right. Because yeah. he first loved us. Um, one thing to note, and you know, sometimes differences in Bible ha Bible translations has to do with with the original text. The New American Standard and the ESV all come from the Westcott and Hort Greek text, which uses older manuscripts. 
whereas the King James and New King James uses the text, uh, Erasmus's text, Textus Receptus, comes from later you know, copies of copies. But here's the point. The American Standard Version used the same uh, Erasmus's text when they rendered theirs. And the ASV says that we love, comma, because he first loved us. So I think we're looking at a, at a translation um, boo-boo uh, <laughs> or, or judgment call. You know. well, pro probably a yeah, text based yeah. boo boo. Yeah. A, 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 probably a choice of text based boo boo. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to comment on, on that. Uh, I think that sometimes uh, it may create some doubt in some folks when we think about and, and we say, well, uh, these two different uh, manuscripts disagree and whether this word should be in there or that word should not be or this passage. Uh, I don't know any and I may be corrected on this, but I don't know of any of those passages that stand in, uh, for instance, this this being one, stand in uh, well, Mark in, in conflict Mark that Sixth. that would cause us to uh, that would cause us to look at this and, and cause us not to be able to establish the point somewhere else, or would put someone's soul in in jeopardy uh, in regard yeah. to that. And so, uh, just for those who are listening. Uh, we, we, we have confidence yeah. in the Word of God. Sometimes there's maybe a debate about a particular passage, but we have confidence uh, that we can establish what it takes for a man to stand right before God and to uh, have a, a secure uh, knowledge of what it takes to be saved. Right, that, yeah, it, yeah that, exactly. And one thing to add to that uh, with the various translations and so on, you know, people have reasons for using translations. Some are good, some are not so good. But the truth is, is they have reasons for what they do. And in this modern age, one of the wonderful things about technology is most of the literal, reliable translations, and that means we're not talking the message, God's word for modern, all that stuff, but most of the modern translations acknowledge the differences. That's, that's in the marginal notes. That's why they are so important You know, as you, as you examine a text. Yeah. They give you variants. And I, I shouldn't have used the term boo-boo while ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a judgment call in, in, the, in the translation and maybe the text. One text had it or two texts had it and so they, right. they put it in here. Yeah. Well, but ahead, anyway, right. it's really important for us to understand, and this kind of re uh, reiterates the point that Paul was making, yeah. there's a reason why we have literally hundreds of thousands of, 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 copies, uh, of, of copies of manuscripts of manuscripts of manuscripts, not the, not the original autographs to be sure, yeah. but we have so many thousands upon thousands uh, that have been discovered that give us the insight to compare against later manuscripts, which by definition uh, are are going to be easier to obtain. They're, they're younger, they have been perhaps preserved uh, simply because they haven't been enduring the elements for a longer period of time. But when we in right. incorporate the greater body of these, that's where the newer translations come in and as Thomas correctly said, most of them actually cite the variances. They, they take note of them, they footnote them so that they're clear. But Paul's point is uh, you know, which of these passages is questionable? We use 1 John 5, 7. We, we may have some disagreement there. Uh, we have this example. This is extremely minor compared to others. But then you've got exactly. the Mark 16. You've got the Mark We're about to get to a major passage. passage. You've got the Mark 16 passage. You know, and there, yeah. are, there, are, there, are, there are even brethren who are saying, uh, well, you know, Mark 16, uh, the, the latter part of the verse or of the chapter probably doesn't belong there or whatever. You know, what does Mark 16, 16 and its immediate context teach that is not taught from other passages? You know, John's or Paul's point is uh, is is valid. We we got to be careful that we're not destroying people's confidence in the Word of God at right. the uh, at, at the same time. But this is a discussion. This isn't, um, there are some time with the intent of this discussion, we do get meaty sometimes, or as meaty as we can get. We do get, we do get detailed, and there are going to be times that we, in the, in the more meatier discussions, kind of have to talk about this, and Paul's right. We don't intend to, to shake the faith of anyone and say, well, now I can't trust the Bible at all because of this. You know, sometimes it helps to understand when we look closely enough at the context 
And so in this case in point, I think it would be a better rendering, we love because he loved us. Because that's right. the context, especially when you flip into verse right. 20 there. Yeah, and my intent yeah. was not to shut down the discussion. No, 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 just, no, no. Just to add to that. Yeah. But, right. but yeah, I, I, understand, I understand that we could establish both points. We love because he first loved us. That is a true statement. Right. Uh, there, there is no doubt about that, that uh, we could go back in this chapter and establish exactly that truth. Uh, we love him because he first loved us yeah. is certainly a, a biblical truth that God showed his love to us yeah. uh, before, uh, uh, well, when we were dead in trespasses and sins, uh, he showed his love toward us. And so these are not we're, we're not uh, debating a, whether that either one of those things is true, yeah. uh, and we're not debating really, no, but no, no, just no, no, pointing no. out that there's a possibility yeah. that if you're using, as I use the New King James, that the word him uh, may not be in the original text. Yeah, but, yeah, but well, remember yeah. in this context, the point of love is not that we loved him, but that he loved us. And right. uh, as uh, John, we, we've just seen earlier in the context. So. Right. Yeah, and, and but... but and I, I was going to say, let me make this observation real quick, though. Tying those two things together, how can we love scripturally if we don't understand love for God and if we don't love God? Right. I mean, it, 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 it ties to it. I, I, and I, I think that that's the ultimate point that we consider here. And, and again, I, I, I kind of look at it, it might be a better idea to say that the word him, or say it without the word him there, from the standpoint of it's talking about our love. But the bottom line is is our love for brethren, our love for our neighbors, our love for our enemies is well, based upon our love for God. That's yeah. right, uh, Tom. And you know, we keep looking backwards. If we look forward and put this in both yeah. the forward and backward context, yeah. the very next statement is, uh, if anyone says, I love God and hates his yeah. brother, he is a liar. And yeah. so uh, that, that in context gives us, uh, helps us to... Uh, ascertain the meaning of what's going on here. Yeah. Um, we need to bring in Daniel's comment just out of sheer courtesy, although we have done moved on from this point, and that's what you get, Daniel, for not being live with us. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> he, he makes a point, and this was six minutes ago, so it, it's it, it's still talking about the judgment of uh, what, right. the, what the judgment was we are looking at a while ago. He says, if this was judgment of men, then Jesus would not be perfected in the love because he experienced agony before his death, which is why I believe it's a final judgment uh, fear there, I'm speaking of there in that chap, uh, mm -hmm. passage there. Yeah, right. And then um, some other questions went on there. So uh, I don't, I don't question the fact that Jesus experienced agony uh, in his death, but I don't believe he experienced fear. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's continue though, because we've got a couple minutes remaining, and I think we can go ahead and complete this chapter, which without much challenge here, uh, because the foundation has already been well established for what we're about to look at, verse twenty. As Paul says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. And here's the reason. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not right. seen? You know, so it's that simple, brethren. You know, if you, you know, how many times have you heard a brother say, I can't stand that brother. I don't want to be around that brother. I don't like that right. brother. To me, if you truly love them the way God loves you, you can't make those statements. And you maybe say, I don't like the sin within their life. You know, yeah. um, I don't like how rude they are to me. <laughs> you know, but, but you've got to love them and treat them in a manner so prescribed by the Scriptures. And this commandment we have from Him, that he who loves God must, must, must love his brother also. Right. So maybe, again, going back to verse 19, maybe the context is supposed to have we love Him. Because he first loved us. Um, I'm just saying only in that, the defining point here is he who loves God. Must what do you love think God. the visual has to do with it? Pardon? What do you think the visual has to do with it? Oh, for who? Uh, for he who does not love his brother whom he oh, has seen. Has, to, has not seen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. Personally, I, the way I view that is uh, we've never seen God. How can we truly say we love God if we see our brethren and we don't love our brethren? You know, and we do not, yeah, and, well, I say, and we, yeah, and I, adding to what you just said there, how can we say we love God when 
the way we treat our brethren demonstrates that we do not understand the love of God. Let me come back to Paul's. Let me come back to yeah. to Paul's question, which I think is an absolutely critical question in this context. On what basis do I love God, but faith? It's certainly it's certainly not sight. It's right. it's not the fact that I've that I've touched him, handled him, whatever. I've taken the testimony of others that by faith I trust God, I love God, etc. You know, the fact of the matter is. There are things that we're going to have to accept of one another by faith. Even yeah. though we do see one another. There are things we're just simply going to have to accept. I, I have no idea that John was baptized uh, into Christ. I have no idea who baptized him. I, I have no basis to uh, to make that judgment there. I baptized myself. No, I'm that, kidding. <laughs> well, oh, here we go now. There we go again. Uh, no, no, no. But there are things that we just simply have to acknowledge grow out of our faith in God, and we've got yep. we, we've got to stop. Well, well first First uh, Corinthians right. four five. Right. We've got to stop judging. Uh, well, picking up the Lord's statement in John seven, we got to stop judging by appearance. We got to start judging righteous judgment. Stop judging anything. Uh, before it's time. Wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things that are hidden in darkness and reveal the motives of men's hearts. I can't possibly know John's motive unless John expresses it to me or I hear it or I see it evident in his life. There are things I'm going to have to accept of John just like I accept, accept things of Paul. Of course, Paul has a plus side going for him because he and I are very similar in this world. Oh, yeah, that's right. And, and as you look at this passage, I was thinking about that we serve God, taking the word love and, and breaking it down into the kind of active goodwill that we do and service that we provide. But we serve God. Uh, we love Him. We uh, do all that we can for His cause uh, by faith. But we see our brother and we see his needs. Uh, we see what we can do for him. He's right in front of us. And so how could we treat him badly? Uh, and then claim to serve a God that we believe in, as John said earlier, by faith. And and a God who has told us to love our brethren. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, I was gonna say I I one observation that I make in this text. Sorry, sorry to cut you, John. But uh, one observation I make here is uh, what we need to understand that it's not just words that he's talking about here. And what I mean by that is. It's one thing for somebody to say, I don't hate my brother. But it's demonstrated by the way that he treats him. I mean, I, I know I know of all kinds of people who who they mistreat one another as brethren and they come up with some ridiculous argument, manipulating words, you know, manipulating scriptural words, you know, uh, calling it righteous, righteous indignation. But in reality, their conduct betrays uh, or demonstrates a hatred by the way that they treat someone else. And, and I, I think that's the point that we need to drive home in this. Okay. All right. Um, one, one more thought. It's easy to say you love someone you've never seen before. Yes. That's easy to do. Um, it's harder to say that you love someone that you know their problems and their challenges and their idiosyncrasies. You know, and so it's easy to say, I love Bob, but you never met Bob. Until Bob comes around, he gets on your nerves. Then that's the greater challenge. And so if we can say that we love our brethren, then truly we love God. If we hate our brethren, then... Right. And, 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 love. and what is even a greater challenge than that is when your brother's wronged you. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, uh, that's, when, that's when this text becomes hard. Yeah. You know, we have a saying... Familiarity breeds contempt, and yes. uh, that is so opposed to what the scriptures teach. Familiarity, knowing a brother's faults, knowing his errors, uh, we come to know that we come to want to help him, yeah. uh, but it, it doesn't. Ca it, it ought not to cause us to feel uh, toward him with contempt in our heart. Uh, yeah. And Rand Randall says, in, in I think it's a good point, Randall says in the chat there uh, that one of the reasons that we have 
that we need to love the man whom we see, and if we claim to love the God who we don't see, as he says in Genesis 1.27, and God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, created he them. And I think that's right, Randall. I think that uh, we realize that God is made in the image of... <laughs> said that backwards, didn't I? Uh, man is made in the image of God, and so we, we can't uh, hate our fellow man, yeah. uh, and especially our brother in Christ, and claim to love a God who created him in his own image. I, two, two things here real quick. Um, based on what Paul just said prior to that, that last point, I think we could equate our love for one another to an individual who loves to buy antiques. You think about it. When you buy antiques, you buy antiques with their dents, dings, faded paint, and you love them for that. You don't want the perfect things. Well, as Christians... And they're valuable. Yeah, and they're valuable. That's right. And as Christians, we have all we all have our own dings and dents and faded paints, you might say. And we love one another despite those things. Uh, Royce, with what you were talking about a while ago, believing what another Christian says, I like 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. You know, we give our brethren the benefit of the doubt, and we take them in faith. Right. Um, all righty then. Um, any final thoughts or comments on First John chapter four? I believe uh, that should put us ready to start next two weeks. Excuse me, two weeks from yep. today in First John chapter five, verse one, on October the sixteenth. Okay. All righty. Well, gentlemen, I think it's time to pull the study to a close. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for our study. Hope that you have a very good two weeks. Uh, we'll return back again on October the 16th, I believe it is. Paul, any final thoughts or comments as we pull this to a close? No, it, it's been a good study today with the exception of John calling me an antique. But, um, <laughs> but no, we are glad that you've joined us today. And let's uh, look at these points, how we can apply them, factor the truth each day. Royce? Well, I was, gonna, I was just making a note to... Uh, Put there on the uh, on the chat room, and I'll just go ahead and say, you know, the minor di the minor differences that uh, that we've expressed here do nothing in the world but sharpen us. Yeah. They sharpen they sharpen iron. Um, we you know we we may or may not see certain things. Randy and I have kind of had a little bit of a, a private uh, going back and forth. Um, uh, and he just sent me another note, but what y'all respond to in just a second, Randy. <laughs> Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the whole point is to sharpen us and make us better students. And uh, where we've, uh, if we've succeeded in that, then we've all been made better students. So right. great study and joy to be with you guys. Absolutely, Tom. Yeah, and and when you do those types of things with one another, it causes us to to actually reevaluate the text for ourselves, which is really the bottom line. And again, I say that this is a very good study. Um, uh, honored to be a part of it. Look forward to continuing this in two weeks. As I, as I stated earlier, I, I, if you were wrapping things up now, uh, uh, during that time, I'm going to try to make arrangements for both Randall and Alan Duvall, along with Joshua. The four of us will will somehow be on a camera. <laughs> Uh, I'll have to I'll have to move this computer, but I'm going to try to do that because we'll be in the midst of our gospel meeting. And speaking of gospel meetings. Uh, oh, if you're in our area in two weeks, uh, feel free to join us. If you need information, go to our website, roseavenue.org, www.roseavenue.org, and the information is right there. Also, Randall, very early on at the beginning, pointed out that this coming, I believe it's Friday through Sunday in, in Waka, Texas, uh, a very small congregation is going to be having a, a meeting with the three of them, or uh, Randall, Allen, and Daniel, I believe it is. So, so uh, if you're in that area, support that effort. The brethren there would be greatly encouraged by that. That's up in northern Texas, by the way, a little bit north of Amarillo. So, anyways, uh, we wanted to mention that. And thank you, Randall, and thank you, everybody, for your comments. Absolutely. All right, Lord willing, we'll see you back here again in two weeks on October 16th at 11 o'clock Central Time.
I was waiting for Tom. Uh, okay, nine, not nine o'clock Pacific. Pacific. I beat you to it. Nine o'clock Pacific. Okay, okay. Uh, um, uh, eleven eleven o'clock Waka, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't be here next week, Paul. <laughs> Did Paul do twelve o'clock Eastern? No, he didn't. Oh, he's, he's lost his sound. Okay, all right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All right, we'll see you here in two weeks at live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful two weeks. <laughs> yes.